Hello and uh, welcome to the Boston uh, Structural Heart and Boston Cardiac uh, YouTube channel. In this uh, How I Do It series, we're going to go over the practical aspects of vena contractor. And I'll demonstrate how I perform and how I use vena contractor in the operating room, what are the nuances of measuring the vena contractor in the operating room, things that can make it uh, more accurate, things can make it more uh, less accurate. We'll go over all these things today. So step one, the principles of vena contractor are that it is based on the principles of hydraulics. This is the extrapolation of fluid dynamics to the, the on uh, intracardiac flows. And if I was to make myself a little smaller, the major principle of vena contractor, as you can see over here, is that the size of hydraulic vena contractor, that is the size of the orifice, the narrowest portion of the orifice, that is the beyond the anatomical orifice area or the anatomical restriction, is independent of the flow rate and driving pressure for a fixed orifice, which means regardless of how high the pressure is and what the flow rate is, the narrowest portion of the orifice remains exactly of the same size. So that's the, the principle of, uh, of measuring vena contractor. That's an extrapolation of a principle of fluid dynamics to uh, intracardiac flows. Now, I cannot reiterate it uh, more uh, that the, the vena contractor has three components. For a valid and a good measurement of vena contractor, three components have to be demonstrated. Number one is jet origin and the flow convergence. Uh, and second is the flow contraction, which means where the flow becomes the narrower. And lastly is the spatial orientation of jet in the, in the flow chamber. So flow convergence, flow contraction, and finally, the flow expansion in the in the rec receiving chamber, and in this case, this would be the the left atrium. Now, uh, this is uh, for two-dimensional vena contractor measurement, as 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 is being shown in this uh, graphic, that it is indispensable to have a linear view of the three components: flow convergence, flow contraction, and flow expansion. And as you can see in this specific example, uh, this portion demonstrates the flow convergence. This demonstrates the flow contraction, and then finally we see up over here, that's the, that's the flow extension in the left atrium. For something to be accurately measured and, and determined, these three components of a vena contractor or a mitral regurgitation jet have to be demonstrated in the same frame. Now, if I go to a few of the things that are measured, uh, demonstrated in the guidelines, and that is that the vena contractor of a color flow Doppler is considerably desk dependent on technical factors, that is, uh, pulse repetition frequency compared to the jet extent. Now, this is an important uh, thing to see, that you can see that the, the size of the jet in the left atrium is a function of fluid entrainment at the same time. So there's some volume that is coming from the left ventricle into the left atrium, and part of it is, you know, the turbulence that the Doppler detects in the left atrium. So the size of the jet is a component of the regurgitant volume as well as the pre-existing volume in the left atrium, which means the faster the jet, the more the turbulence, the higher the jet area. But however, as you can see here, that the at the time of the vena contractor, that is immediately distal to the effective orifice area or the regurgitant orifice area, the jet hasn't had the time to entrain a lot of fluid into it or the, or the surrounding fluid hasn't been disturbed that much to cause a greater rise or, or make it look bigger. So closer to the effective regurgitant orifice area or at the point of vena contractor, there hasn't been enough time to entrain more fluid and therefore that width of the jet is truly a representative of the effective regurgitant orifice area. However, as you can see further in this, in this, in, in this issue is that it's a very it's a small measurement. And if you can make a small measurement on a screen, a small deviations of the caliper can lead to bigger uh, uh, you know, uh, errors in measurement. And that would imply that the severity of the jet can actually change from mild to moderate to severe. Now also, the problem is that you know uh, the uh, the color flow Doppler and the grayscale are acquired intermittently. So sometimes, because of you know translation motion of the heart and motion of the T probe, and when we put these parallel processing puts both you know components of interrogation together, there can be a certain bleed over of the color flow Doppler over the grayscale, leading to a slightly higher or a larger or 
uh, vena contracta than the actual effective orifice area. So there may be a slight uh, overestimation of the size of the vena contracta. However, at the end of the day, according to the guidelines, this is a good semi-quantitative means of looking at the mitral regurgitation. So if I was to go here, now the next most important thing is where and how to measure the vena contracta. Now as it is shown that it has to be oriented, the, the scan plane has to be oriented as perpendicular uh, to, the, to the line of the jet as it is possible, as you can see in this specific graphic over here, which corresponds to, so this graphic on the, on the right side, and that is when the jet is going exactly smack in, uh, uh, the scan plane is going smack in the middle of A2P2, going from anterior to posterior. Now that corresponds to the mid-esophageal long axis view where you have the maximal axial, you know, uh, measurement accuracy measuring from front to backwards and not the, the width of the jet that would be coming out, as you can see in this specific graphic. If you measure here in this direction, which I'll soon demonstrate, you will actually be overestimating the severity of, of vena contracta. So this is the line of measurement of vena contracta, that is the mid-esophageal long axis view, and let's look at it in, in a little bit more detail. So let's just see that we have this uh, on-fast view of the mitral valve on the left side, as you can see here. This is an on-fast view. This is the anterolateral commissure. This is the posteromedial commissure. This is the aortic valve. This is the left atrial appendage, and we have a broad jet that is coming out of the mitral valve. Now, if we were to make this measurement in this frame, that is the, the transcommissional frame that we are looking at here, this would correspond to a section going through the jet in this direction, which is you're looking at the width of the jet in this direction, which is kind of overestimating the severity of the jet. However, if you really want to know how broad the jet is in its axial direction, you have to look at it orthogonally. As you can see in this one, that corresponds to the mid-esophageal long axis scan plane, and that would be in this specific orientation. So that's one of the most important besides demonstrating the flow convergence, contraction, and expansion that vena contracta is actually measured in the right uh, orientation uh, when using two-dimensional echocardiography. Next thing is how do I measure it? Now, the image has to be zoomed in so that as I measure, measured in the beginning, that smaller errors have to be let, lead to smaller errors in quantification. So you have to have the, lo, the, the least amount of depth, so I have the biggest image. You have to use the zoom if it is possible, as you can see in this specific image. And at the same time, while it is not mentioned in the guidelines, but I have found that you know using the, the baseline shift towards the direction of flow, in this case, uh, using the baseline towards the left atrium, as you can see, uh, the, flow, the moving the baseline up in the direction of the flow, actually sort of, I, I have found that it helps in clearly identifying the narrowest portion of the jet, which sometimes if there's a lot of turbulence, it is sometimes difficult to, difficult to identify. So if you are carefully looking at this thing, you can see that up here, I have moved the baseline towards the direction of flow, that is towards the left atrium, and that has led to a very accurate demonstration of where I can measure the meter contractor and head, therefore makes it look better and actually makes it more accurate. So that's my own personal orientation. If you can see in this one is I shift the baseline towards the direction of flow when measuring MR, that is towards the left atrium. I do an ad adequate Nyquist limit adjustment, use a zoom mode or reduce the depth and also use the mid-esophageal long axis view to measure the vena contractor. The next comes the most important thing, which is using a three-dimensional R-wave gated acquisition to have enough line density and spatial orientation to get enough multiplanar frames to extract the actual true mid-esophageal long axis view and be able to define the jet in its entirety using the three-dimensional image. For example, in this, in this um, uh, graphic, as you can see, we, what over here we have is a volume gated R with the two true rendered image that you can look at it. Now these are three extracted multiplanar frames and we can actually, like showing in this graphic, we have extracted the exact and the most important, the most accurate looking vena contracta, uh, you know, uh, in this entire volume and are we able to make the measurement and and correct the measurements can be made 
in identifying the true entirety of the jet and, and getting to the flow contraction, flow convergence, contraction, and expansion. So therefore, 3D imaging, when possible, uh, particularly our wave gated acquisition, is very, very important in exactly or accurately measuring the vena contractor. Now, if you don't have R wave gated acquisition, you can use it with you know the high volume rate or a single beat with less line density and high frame rate, but but the spatial orientation suffers a lot in that, and I am not so certain it, it is actually as accurate as it is otherwise would be, you know. So therefore, at the end of the day, the vena contractor has these pros and cons. That is when measured using two-dimensional echocardiography. First is the mid-esophageal long axis view should be used. Uh, that is the most optimal imaging plane for measuring the vena contracta. Best measured when flow convergence, contraction, and expansion can be demonstrated in the same frame. So as I said, it is a surrogate for the effective regression to orifice area because the jet hasn't had time to entrain more fluid, so that truly represents the size of the jet at the, time, at the point of effective regression to orifice area. It is independent of flow rate and driving pressure for a fixed orifice, we saw that, and can be applied in eccentric jet and less dependent on technical factors. However, more important is that it is problematic in the presence of multiple jets, that I'll just show you in a second. And convergence needs to be visualized for adequate measurement and overestimation when MR is not holosystolic, which means if the vena contractor in the entire range of systole is achieved for only a period of time, just in the, in the beginning portion, if the jet is short duration, doesn't extend throughout the systole, then you can use, it may be a big vena contractor for just about the first third of systole and then there's nothing after that. But you are using a single frame measurement and extrapolating it to the entire cardiac cycle, which may lead to overestimation of the severity of MR based on a single frame. So that's a major limitation of using vena contractor, particularly for those jets that are not holosystolic, which means that vena contractor is not maintained throughout systole and you're overestimating the severity of regurgitation. As you can see in this particular you know, graphic also, that this is a complex mitral regurgitation jet, which has three jets coming out of it and all are not only spatially, but temporally different. And, and as you can see here, this is one jet that is going in this direction. This is another jet going in a different direction. This is a single third jet going in this direction. So it, it, you know, it's, it remains out there, which is the best way of estimating vena contracta in that. Some studies suggest adding the width. Some studies suggest that if adding the effective regression to orifice area, all the three separate jets can add to it. But again, the limitations of the quality of imaging, the frame rate, the line density can sometimes significantly you know, le uh, lead to significant errors in this situation. So now, uh, at the end of the day, vena contracta is a measure of the effective regression to orifice area. It shows great separation between, you know, mild and severe based on 0.3 for mild and more than 0.7 for severe mitral regurgitation. However, it, 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 the, for the moderate range, it really is, is not that accurate. And we have to, you know, do an integrative, uh, you know, decision making, which means we have to have multiple uh, modalities used to make the same diagnosis and hedge our bets based on the number of modalities saying the same thing and not depend on an outlier. Now, 3D echocardiography is a very important because it not only allows extraction of multiplanar frames to get to the frames that demonstrate the best, you know, the components of the jet, but also direct measurement of unit contractor can be used in this one. And however, one of the most important things, the Doppler blooming artifact that I said, because the grayscale and the color are being acquired at different times and being superimposed on that, and therefore sometimes spatial and temporal misalignment can lead to blooming, which lead to that you can have a slightly, I would say, a larger uh, measured uh, vena contracta leading to overestimation of the mitral regurgitation jet. So these are the important pros and cons of vena contracta that you should keep in your mind. You know. Lastly, when we go down to looking at the 3D vena contractor, it is a color flow sector should be as narrow as possible to improve volume rates and line density, which means you have to have the highest temporal as well as the spatial resolution. You have to be able to perfectly align the orthogonal planes so you can extract the, the, the true vena contractor out of that. Then planimeter the high velocity and alias signal of vena contractor avoiding low velocity dark colored signals. So these are all 
uh, you know, those things that depend on how good are the, uh, the quality of the initial images, how good the frame rate is and how much line density you have, you know. And so therefore, you can also, the good part is that you can use the multiplanar frame and move the, the scan plane back and forth to measure, mu you know, multiple jets and, and, uh, and also, it can also, you know, overcome some of the limitations of PISA in these situations. However, it is subject to the same limitations as is, uh, you know, uh, 2D Vena contractor. This is Doppler blooming artifact, overestimation of the MR when it is not holosystolic, which means when that degree of Vena contractor does not extend to the entire range of systole, then it is a little problem. And finally, it is cumbersome, requires offline analysis. You need to have spatial and temporal alignment, which is only possible if you have, uh, you know, R wave gated acquisition. You can have apnea, lack of surgical motion, lack of electrical interference. So, a lot of ifs and buts before you get to that image. And all these images that you see in presentations are not always practically possible in the operating room or when doing an awake patient. So, therefore, on the, on the, on the 3D vena contractor, it is, in, uh, the regurgit it, it has demonstrated the limitations of assessment of mitral regurgitation by these methods, like one of them. For example, that the mitral regurgitation office is often crescentic in shape and secondary MR. And in such cases, assumption of a circular orifice ge geometry inherent to vena contractor width may result in underestimation because the jet is very wide. You're not appreciating the width of the jet, you're just looking at the breadth of it, and therefore, you may be underestimating the severity. So it is possible to overestimate the severity as well as underestimate the severity. So therefore, some of these, you know, uh, and the incorporation of 3D imaging has highlighted this limitation of inner contractor, but we, and there are ways and means of overcoming this thing, which is going you know, to be on the scope of this presentation, but we should know these limitations. So in the final analysis in this image, as you can see, if I stand in the middle of it, vena contractor should be measured in the mid-esophageal long axis view when you are doing the, the measurement. You should have the least amount of depth. That is the largest image that you can achieve. You should adjust the color flow Doppler, uh, Nyquist limit. If possible, move the you know, baseline towards the direction of flow. Use the zoom mode uh, and demonstrate the narrowest portion of the jet and in addition to the vein flow convergence, contraction, and expansion to demonstrate the vena contractor and make a measurement which is devoid of error and minimizes the chance of, you know, all these limitations that I said. I hope you learned something. Uh, another one in the How I Do It series. Thank you.